Individual loans sold in the preceding 12 months amounted to rupees 23,093 crores as compared to rupees 18,273 crores uh, in the previous year. Our individual loan book increased to rupees 376,020 crores, a growth of 14% over the previous year. In addition to this, the loan securitized by the corporation and outstanding as of June 30th, 2021, amounted to rupees 73,471 crores. HDFC continues to service these loans. Individual loans outstanding on an AUM basis amounted to rupees 4,49,491 crores. Individual loan growth on an AUM basis was also 14%. If the loans amounting to rupees 23,093 crores had not been sold, then the growth in the individual loan book would have been 22%. With regard to the non-individual portfolio, we have seen a decline during the quarter. There are several reasons for this. Over the last 12 months, we have seen large prepayments on our LRD portfolio from the REITs issue, which has had an impact on the growth of the non-individual book. However, the pipeline of business in the non on in the LRD segment uh, remains reasonably strong. Also, construction activity significantly slowed down, particularly in the months of April and the first fortnight of May. This led to slow a uh, slowdown in disbursements in the construction finance book. Consequent to this, we had a degrowth in the non-individual loan book. However, we have a strong pipeline of some large proposals which we expect to disperse over the coming quarter. We expect a positive growth for the year. During the year, or during the quarter rather, our overall loan book increased to rupees 5,490 crores. The assets under management as of June 30th, 2021, amounted to rupees 5,74,136 crores as compared to rupees 5,31,186 crores in the previous year. Repayments on retail loans on an annualized basis were lower at 8.2% of the opening loan book as compared to 10.3% in the previous year. The average size of individual loans for the quarter ended June 30th, 2021 stood at rupees 30.9 lakhs compared to rupees 29.5 lakhs in FY 2021. Our thrust on affordable housing loans continued unabated. During the quarter ended June 30th, 2021, 33% of home loans approved in volume terms and 14% in value terms were to customers from the economically weaker section and the lower income groups. The average home loan to the, to the economically weaker section and the lower income group segment stood at rupees 11.1 lakh for the EWS category and rupees 19.3 lakhs for the LIG category. If we break up the loan book outstanding on June 30th, 2021 on an AUM basis into different categories, then individual loans constitute 78% of the total book as compared to 74% in the first quarter of the previous year. Construction finance constitutes 10% of the total loan book. Lease rental discounting loans constitute 6% of the total loan book, while corporate loans also constitute 6%. If we look at the incremental loan book growth and split that growth between individuals and non-individuals, then for the quarter in the June 30th, 2021, the entire growth is on account of the individual loan book. Total loan source from distribution channels is 99%, of which HDFC sales is 53%, HDFC bank is 29%, and third-party DSAs is 17%. Thus, 83% of HDFC's individual business was sourced directly or through our associates. The emergency credit line guarantee scheme was further extended during the quarter to mitigate the economic distress caused by the second wave of the pandemic. In the previous year, under ECL GS 1 and 2, the corporation had approved an amount of rupees 2,509 crores, of which rupees 1,391 crores has been dispersed by June 2021. Amounts dispersed under this facility are guaranteed by the government. As of date, the applications received for ECL GS 3.0 amounts to only rupees 266 crores or five basis points of our loan book. 
The Reserve Bank of India permitted a one-time restructuring of loans under its resolution for COVID-19-related stress. In this regard, and as I informed last quarter, the aggregate amount of loans for which restructuring has been implemented under OTR1 was Rs. 3,704 crores, which is 0.7% of the loan. In the current year, OTR2 was announced in respect of individual and small business loans, which are standard as of March 31st, 2021. OTR 2.0 is currently in the process of being implemented, and the last date of invocation is September 30th, 2021. As of date, we have received applications for restructuring of loans amounting to Rs. 778 crores. Out of the loans under OTR 1 and 2, 38% are individual loans and 62% are non-individual loans. Also out of the total uh, restructured loans, as much as 62% is in respect of one, uh, just one single account, which we had talked about in the last quarter. The aggregate of loans covered under OTR 1 and 2 is 0.9% of the loan book. Let me then talk a little bit about collection efficiency. Though there was a minor impact on collection efficiency during April and May, the overall collection efficiency for individual loans has improved during the month of June to pre-COVID levels. The collection efficiency for individual loans on a cumulative basis in June 2021 stood at 98.3% compared to 98% in March 2021. The second wave of the pandemic has, however, led to an increased strain on individual collections, especially in the 30-day past two and 60-day past two buckets, leading to slippages in the first quarter. As per regulatory norms, the gross non-performing loans as of June 30, 2021, still have rupees 11,120 crores, equivalent to 2.24% of the loan portfolio. Non-performing individual loans stood at 1.37%, whilst non-performing non-individual loans stood at 4.87%. Individual loan NPA increased due to slippages on account of the impact of the second wave of the pandemic. Collection efforts were hampered due to the recovery teams being unable to do field visits during the lockdown period. Further, various court orders temporarily curbed recovery efforts of financial institutions, including refraining possession activities under surfacing, and this also hampered the collection effort. The non-individual asset quality has held well, and the marginal uptake in the NPA percentage is consequent to the degrowth of the book in the quarter. During the quarter, we have also seen some resolutions in certain non-individual loans. As per regulatory norms, based solely on the period of default, the corporation is required to carry a total provision of Rs. 5,778 crores as of June 30th, 2021. As against this, the actual provision carried is as much as Rs. 13,189 crores. The excess provision over the regulatory requirement is Rs. 7,411 crores, which is 128% higher than the minimum required under the regulations. Under index accounting, both asset classification and provision have moved from the incurred loss model to the expected credit loss model for providing for future credit losses. Based on the model, the total exposure at default of rupees rough 5 lakh crores is broken up as under 90.8% is stage 1, 6.6% is stage 2, and 2.6% is stage 3. The composition of the EAD based on the staging has broadly remained the same as at March 2021. During the quarter, we have charged the profit and loss account with a sum of rupees 686 crores towards additional provisioning. The ECL to EAD coverage ratio for stage two assets is 18% and for stage three is 48%. The provisions carried as a percentage of the EAD amounted to 2.64%. As of June 30th, 2021, we carry a COVID-19 provisioning of Rs. 1,017 crores, uh, which is 8% of the overall provisioning. We will, in the course of this year, review whether we need to continue carrying this uh, provisioning. 
credit costs for quarter one were 50, 50 five zero basis points, of which 13 basis points were an account of an additional COVID provisioning of rupees 173 crores. As a prudent measure on account of the impact of the pandemic, we continue to have credit costs of around 50 basis points, but we are confident that as the situation normalizes, we should over the next couple of years be in a position to significantly reduce the credit costs. This in turn will have a positive impact on the return on equity. We continue to hold all our investments in HDFC Bank, HDFC Life, HDFC Management, HDFC Asset Management, and all our other subsidiary and associate companies at the original cost of acquisition, which is the price we are paid whilst making those investments. These investments are not accounted for on a fair value basis. If we were to mark to market the investments as of June 30th, 2021, the unrealized gain, which is the difference between the market price as of June 30th, 2021, and the carrying cost would be rupees 2,61,068 crores of rupees. The unrecognized gain is not part of our network, nor is it part of our capital adequacy calculations. During the previous year, RBI had mandated that the corporation reduce its equity shareholding to 50% or below in HDFC Elko. The reduction in the shareholding of HDFC Elko got completed in May 2021. Even after the reduction of the shareholding to below 50%, HDFC Elko will continue to be consolidated under index. As a part of the capital raise in August 2020, we raised warrants at an issue price of rupees 180 rupees and an exercise price of rupees 2,165 rupees per share. As of date, no warrants have been converted into equity shares. Our capital adequacy uh, stands at 22%, of which tier one capital is 21.3%, and tier two capital is 0.7%. This is well about the regulatory requirement of what we are required to carry. Dividend for financial year 21 was paid out in July 21 after our annual general meeting, and this has consumed 110 basis points of capital. In August 2020, we had raised equity of rupees 10,000 crores on a QIP basis to inter alia augmenting the long-term resources of the corporation and to finance organic and inorganic business opportunities within the group over the next three to four years. As of now, we have not made any investment in a new business. However, we are continuing to explore such opportunities. At this stage, it is important to talk of return on equity. Return on equity on tier one capital for quarter one was 14.1%. As you are aware, HDFC transitioned to index accounting in 2018. As a part of the index accounting, network includes account heads which do not form part of the tier one calculations under the prudential regulations. These include index transition reserve, deferred tax liability on special reserve, fair value gain on investments for OCI, investments in subsidiaries associates in excess of 10% of net owned funds, and securitization gains recognized. These items aggregated to rupees 22,956 crores. Hence, tier one capital is rupees 85,826 crores as compared to the reported net worth of 1,8,783 crores. In view of the above, a more appropriate way of calculating the return on equity would be, do, would be to do so on tier one capital as against the conventional method of computing it on net worth. During the fourth quarter, the corporation's total borrowing increased to rupees 4,38,413 crores. Term loans, including external commercial borrowing and refinance from National Housing Bank, accounted for 24% of borrowings. Market borrowing, that is NCDs and commercial paper, accounted for 41% of borrowings. Deposits were a major source of funding during the year. Deposits as at the quarter end amounted to rupees 1,53,703 crores and constitute 35% of total borrowings. 61% of the deposits were onboarded digitally. I've always emphasized that there are two ways to look at net interest income. One method is to consider only interest and the other is to also consider the profit that is booked at the time of selling alone. Under both methods, the net interest income growth for the quarter is similar, almost similar. 
if we were to calculate the net interest of income purely on the basis of interest without taking any cognizance of the profit on sale of investments then the net interest income for the quarter in the June 30th 2021 was rupees 4147 crores compared to rupees 3392 crores in the corresponding quarter of the previous year giving a growth of 22% the second way to compute the net interest income is to also include the income on sale of loans. Under index accounting standards, when a loan is sold, the discounted future net income on the loan has to be accounted for upfront and is reflected as a separate item in the profit and loss account. During the quarter, we sold that loans aggregating to rupees 5,489 crores and booked an income of rupees 267 crores. If we were to include this amount of rupees 267 crores as part of the net interest income, which is the way all analysts do, and also consider similar income in the corresponding quarter of the previous year, then the net interest income for the quarter would be rupees 4,414 crores compared to rupees 3,576 crores in the first quarter of the previous year, uh, amounting to an increased of 23%. So net interest income based only on interest grew 22% and including sale of loans grew by 23%. One of the reasons for a sharp increase in the net interest income is because the interest income in quarter one has declined by 5%, whereas interest costs have declined by as much as 17%. The average level of liquidity carried this year in the first quarter in liquid funds was Rs. 15,225 crores as compared to Rs. 32,000 crores last year, thus reducing the negative carry. Also in the first quarter of the previous year, the non-individual disbursements were largely back-ended. Thirdly, we shifted some of our surplus liquidity from liquid fund investments to government securities, which provide a slightly higher yield. So in addition to the 15,225 crores we hold in uh, uh, liquid funds, we also hold an additional 9,200 crores in government securities. Net interest margins for the quarter ended June 30th, 2021 stood at 3.7% compared to 3.1% in the first quarter of the previous year. Net interest margin the previous year was also impacted by the negative carry on the liquidity carried by the corporation. The spread on loans over the cost of borrowing for the quarter in the June 30th, 2021 was 2.29%. The spread on the individual loan book was 1.93% and on the non-individual book was 3.32%. The spread on loans during the first quarter of the previous year was 2.26%. Income earned from deployment of surplus funds in cash management schemes of mutual funds was much lower at Rs. 124 crores, crores as compared to Rs. 362 crores in the first quarter of the previous year. This was due to a sharp drop in short-term rates where we earned 3.16% on our surplus liquidity as compared to 4.52% in the previous year. Also, the average level of liquidity carried this year in the first quarter in liquid funds was lower. During the quarter, we earned uh, 16 crores, one six, 16 crores by way of dividend income as compared to as much as 298 crores in the first quarter of the previous year. Dividend in the previous year was largely on account of the dividend received from HDFC investment. In the current year, HDFC Bank, HDFC Life, and HDFC Asset Management have declared dividends, which will be received in quarter two, and accordingly will be booked in the second quarter. The total such dividend for the second quarter will be in the range of around 1,100 crores, compared to rupees 322 crores in the second quarter of the previous year. During the quarter, the corporation has booked profit on sale of investments amounting to rupees 263 crores. This compares to as much as rupees 1,241 crores in the first quarter of the previous year. The profit on sale of investments was an account of divestment of a small part of our stake in HDFC Ergo to comply with the regulatory requirement and the entire stake in good host spaces and associate companies. Profit on sale of investments during the first quarter of the previous year was largely on account of sale of part of our holding in HDFC life in order to be compliant with the regulations.
Under index accounting standards, the stock options granted to employees are measured at the fair value of the options and the date of grant. This fair value is accounted for as employee compensation cost over the vesting period of the options. Accordingly, employee benefit expenses for the quarter includes an amount of rupees 146 crores compared to only rupees 1.5 crores during the first quarter of the previous year. Last year's charge to the profit and loss account is very low in the first quarter since options were granted only during the second quarter. For the quarter ended June 30th, 2021, the cost income ratio stood at 8.0% compared to 9% in the first quarter of the previous year. For the quarter ended June 30th, 2021, the standalone profit before tax was rupees 3,905 crores compared to rupees 3,607 crores in the first quarter of the previous year, a growth of 8%. Although we've had a very healthy growth in net interest income, the growth in profit before tax was lower uh, than normal due to dividend and profit on sale of investments in the previous year being significantly higher. As explained earlier, dividend income of rupees 1147 odd crores from our group companies will be received in the second quarter of the current year. Tax for the first quarter stood at rupees 904 crores compared to rupees 555 crores in the first quarter of the previous year. The tax rate for this for the first quarter of this year was 23.1% compared to 15.4% in the previous year. The higher tax rate during the first quarter of the current year is, account, is on account of the fact that dividend income, which is tax-free in our hands, and profit on sale of investments uh, is much lower this year compared to the previous year. We expect a sharp drop in the effective tax rate during the second quarter as we receive higher dividend income. The standalone profit of the tax for the first quarter stood at rupees 3,001 crores compared to rupees 3,052 crores in the first quarter of the previous year. Pre-tax return on average assets was 2.8% and the post-tax return on average assets was 2.2%. The basic and diluted earnings per share on a face value of rupees 2 per share was rupees 16.63 and rupees 16.45 respectively. The consolidated profit before tax for the first quarter stood at rupees 6,295 crores as compared to rupees 4,816 crores, a growth of 31%. After providing rupees 984 crores for taxes, where previous year's figure was 758 crores for taxes, the consolidated profit after tax for the first quarter stood at rupees 5,311 crores as compared to rupees 4,058 crores in the first quarter of the previous year, giving a growth of 31%. The profit attributable to the corporation was rupees 5,041 crores as compared to rupees 3,614 crores in the previous year, an increase of 39%. As of June 30th, 2021, we had 3,348 employees. Total assets per employee stood at rupees 164 crores, and net profit per employee was rupees 3.6 crores. HDFC's dividend network spans 603 outlets, which include 202 offices of HDFC's wholly owned distribution company, HDFC Sales Private Limited. HDFC covers additional locations through its outreach programs. To cater to non-resident Indians, we have offices in London, Dubai, and Singapore, and service associates in the Middle East. During these trying times, I do believe we have much to be grateful for. Our employees have been working relentlessly through extremely difficult circumstances, and it is their efforts that has helped the organization tide over trying times. It remains our constant endeavor to keep raising the bar on customer service. The well-being of our employees is paramount to us. 85% of our employees have received at least one dose of the vaccine. We also appreciate the measures taken by the government and our regulators in bringing confidence and stability in the financial system, which in turn has helped the organization navigate the past few quarters. We will continue to engage deeply with all our stakeholders Towards this end, we stand committed to ESG parameters. 
SEBI has recently mandated the Business Responsibility and Sustainability Report, which will be mandatory requirement from FY 2023. On a voluntary basis, we have prepared the uh, Business Responsibility and Sustainability Report for the previous year ended uh, FY 2021, and we will host it on our website this evening for easy access. The bar are some of the highlights of the results for the quarter in the June 30, 20, uh, June 30th, 2021. Before I conclude, I would like to wish each one of you good health. Please stay safe. We may now proceed to question answers, and I would request all of you to kindly introduce yourselves and be brief with your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin with the question and answer session. Anyone wishing to ask a question, may please press star and one on your touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself in the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management is able to address questions from all participants in this conference, we request you to limit your questions to two per participant only. If time permits, you can come back in the question queue for a follow-up question. The first question is from the line of Kanal Shah from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks and uh, uh, congratulations for good set of numbers. Uh, two questions. Firstly, in terms of this restructuring, which was down from 4,400 last time to 3,700, no doubt you have added the pipeline. But uh, uh, what would be the reason for that? Is it like it has paid up and it is also out of the stage two in the non-individual account and that's the reason stage two is more or less flat in the non-individual quarter on quarter? See, Kunal, any loan that is restructured is automatically downgraded. Uh, even if the past payment record was on time, it is automatically downgraded to stage two. So all restructured loans are put under stage two. In this second, in this uh, current round of restructuring, we have not received too many applications as of as yet. Uh, the total applications we have received so far amount to about 778 crores. And, it, and the first round of restructuring had been done in the previous year. So that, you are aware, the, 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 those numbers were disclosed in the previous year. Total restructuring is 0.9% of the total book. No, so last time it was 4,400 and now it is uh, 3,700. Okay, so that's the only question in terms of what happened with those 700 uh, crores of the accounts. Uh, is it like they've got uh, upgraded and uh, recovered? Kunal, can I can I answer that question? Yeah, 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 contract. Yeah. So so basically, you know, the the restructuring one got completed. Uh, so some of them uh, did not get implemented. They had uh, they were invoked, but ultimately did not get implemented. They pulled out. So the number that you have is the final one which got implemented under OTR one. Kunal, what happens is a lot of people first ask for a restructuring and then things improve for them and then they back out of the restructuring. So that's probably what happened. Okay, sure, sure. And uh, uh, secondly, in terms of this qualifying asset definition, uh, uh, so based on our book, if I were to uh, look at it, how maybe given that it's on the total assets and uh, how much does it qualify on the individual side and how would we be realigning the uh, book structure to follow the norms? Uh, would that be required or we are expecting something to come in from, uh, say, the regulator on this? So may, may I answer Keki on this? Go ahead, go ahead, Rangan. On this qualifying book, uh, Kunal, the, uh, we are fairly, uh, there are two numbers are there. One is a 60% number and one is a 50% number. Against the 50%, uh, we are already higher than that. And as far as the 60 is concerned, we are very close to that. And to be very precise, it is about 51.7% on the 50% number and it is 57.2% on the 60% number. This is as of the 31st uh, uh, March. Yeah, so how would we look at it in terms of uh, uh, achieving this number, uh, given that it becomes applicable then? Time frame, there is a three-year time frame to reach that qualifying numbers. 
and uh, we have submitted our uh, plan to RBI as to how we will be moving in this uh, direction. So as you can see, these numbers are very close to where the qualifying numbers are. So we should be very pretty, uh, you know, on track as far as the plan is concerned. I think some yes. bit of very carefully, uh, you know, appraised construction finance, retail, housing loans, particularly in the affordable sector. Plus, I think also an emphasis on our retail business, where you've seen our uh, branches have gone, uh, gone up to over 600. So reaching out more and getting more retail business and also some bit of, uh, you know, uh, construction finance for developers in the right segment where, you know, we see the market. And also some of the non-qualifying book like investments and some of these investments as they get, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, changing their color from investment to cash and all that, these numbers will also undergo a change. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Thank you. The next question is in the line of Maruk Alijania from Ilara Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, my first question is on the uh, stage two in the non-individual book. Uh, so how much uh, uh, can we say that it has peaked now? And then how much of that stage two would be, or what proportion of that stage two would be in any advanced stage of resolution or recovery? It's very difficult to ever say that everything, if there's something has peaked, but to my mind, uh, unless there is another major third wave which happens or something else which is destructive, I don't think we will see too much of a change in uh, stage two loans. Uh, to my mind, whatever was, wherever we saw the slightest degree of stress, we have downgraded them from stage one to stage two. But obviously, going forward, how the future foretells, if there is a major third wave, all that could change. But at the moment, we think uh, we don't see too much uh, uh, increase in stage two going forward. Well, any proportion of how much of the developer or the non-individual book would be in very uh, advanced stages of recovery or resolution? So there is a recover, there is a resolution which is trying to, which we are trying to arrive at in every single loan. Now some are more advanced, some are less advanced. I won't be able to give you a number on how much is uh, uh, what the stage of advancement is. But you would have seen that in this quarter also there was there were resolutions. Uh, because of those resolutions, the number of uh, stage three accounts would have come down, and some stage two accounts also would have come down. Got it. And my next question is on LRD. So because of REITs, would there be uh, um, a permanent problem in growth of LRD? I know that this time around there was cyclicality because of the uh, COVID wave. But would there be a permanent growth issue in LRD because of REITs? And then no, how does that impact on LRD? Uh, Maruk, I don't think so. Yeah, let me finish. I don't sure, think sure. so. I think the LRD book will grow well. We have a strong pipeline of LRD cases as we speak right now. What happens is that the builder first starts constructing. Once he starts constructing, he takes construction finance. After the construction is completed, it gets converted into a lease rental discounting. And at then, then at some point in future, it moves into a REIT. So in the last, last year was one year where we had the impact of two large REITs which got formed and where a large part of the loan was, was paid back. But these loans will get replenished as the year progresses. Okay, thanks a lot. And only one last question, if you could share the number of write-offs for the quarter. Uh, total write-off number for the quarter was around, uh, memory search me right around, I'll give, you, I'll give you in a minute. Conrad, you have a ready number? I think it was 500 crores, 500 crores. 500 yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Suresh Kanbati from Macquarie Group. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Just two questions. One is on this uh, restructured book. You are telling 62% is non-individual, and you are saying that 62% of the overall restructured pertains to one account. So you mean to say the entire non-individual book is just one account? Is it confusing if you look at it, what is there in the press release? So the answer is yes. 
So only a restructure that account will be non-individual. No other non-individual book has been restructured. Actually, there is another account which is very, very small. I think it's it's under 10 crores. So it's a small amount. But for all practical purposes, it is the same account. Okay, okay. Good. So that's clear. Now the other question is, you know, um, you know, the corporate book growth or the non-individual book growth is bringing down your overall loan growth. So if you look at it on a headline basis, it is just 8%. Um, and this is, of course, a high margin book. So, or a higher ROA book, perhaps. So, you know, unless you get this uh, going up, it becomes very difficult to even post a double-digit overall loan growth. So how are you looking at it from an opportunity perspective? Um, Suresh, I think I mentioned that some bit of the growth this quarter was impacted by several factors. One was because of COVID, construction finance had slowed down, so builders were not constructing. Obviously, if they were not constructing, we were not dispersing loans. Uh, some of the old loans got settled. Uh, some amount went into REITs because of, of what we discussed earlier. So it's a combination of all these factors which led to a decline in the non-individual book during this quarter. Our sense is to be based on the pipeline that we see ahead of us, we would expect to end the year with a positive growth. But also let me tell you that the spreads that we are talking about or the net interest margin that we are talking of is actually at a much higher level than what historically it has been, despite the fact that the non-individual book is showing a degrowth. Our net interest margin for the quarter is 3.7%, and historically, as last year's first quarter was 3.1%, but let's not look at that. Normally, our net interest margin is in the 32 to 3.3% range. Yeah. And the last question, if I can squeeze in, uh, what explains the reduction in interest expense? I mean, have you seen some cost of fund reduction because of some earlier high cost borrowings being uh, repaid or prepaid? That's a constant process that will keep happening, Suresh, because as the older borrowings keep getting paid back, newer borrowings come in at a lower rate, and therefore the cost of funding also comes down. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Prakhar Agarwal from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just two questions. One, uh, just wanted to check for the customer segment that we deal with. How important is this mobility of collections team to, for us to see this sort of uh, NPA, right? Because I think uh, the, by, this could not be managed with all this steady con and everything. How important is mobility of collection team for the customer segments that we deal with? So one is, one is, of course, mobility. The other is also surfacing the legal action that is possible to be taken. Now, because of the pandemic, most high courts have said that you cannot take legal action against a customer. So a combination of not being, not being able to take legal action, coupled with the fact that we have not been able to make visits, has affected collection in some cases. But as I mentioned in my call, that July itself saw a 98.3% collection efficiency compared to 98% in March. So July was a lot, lot better. So, so I just wanted to understand, so while I understand from a recovery perspective, from collection perspective, uh, given the customers that we deal more salary segment and, and uh, towards that extent, why is there such a high default level? Is there an income drop in the customer base that you're seeing? Is, is that a reason why there is a default rise? Uh, I'm not even talking about collection at this point in time. So there will there be people who are one month and two months outstanding who would not have been able to pay an installment during this quarter and therefore have slipped into a 90-day category. That could be one of the reasons. The other is not that all our customers are salaried employed. Uh, we also have self-employed customers. Self-employed customers would have been more, more impacted during the uh, COVID first and second wave than, uh, than, than employed customers. We have not seen that many job losses. Uh, our sense is that if normalcy prevails and we don't see a major third wave, we should over the next end and, and recovery effort uh, can start afresh in the sense that legal action can start afresh. I would expect that within a reasonable period of time, we should get uh, our non-performing loans back to what they used to be in pre-COVID levels. But that would be a step. It will take a little while for it to get back to pre-COVID levels. Perfect. Just uh, one more question, if I could use it. In, in terms of any indication for the channel-wise, how are we seeing stress in terms of DSA, SDFC sales, SDFC bank? Where is this 
uh, large part of this is concentrated in any particular channel or it, it's uh, not nothing is specific across no nothing like that it's just pretty much broad based across the across the different channels Sure. And and one last data point in terms of gross stage three in lap, if you could just highlight. A stage three lap, you're saying? Yes, lap portfolio. Conrad, would you have a figure? Stage three lap. See, lap. I think I do not have it, but just uh, as brother, as you are aware, that the lap is a uh, is under five percent of our portfolio. So I don't think it's going to be a big number. It's not a big number, but I can yeah. get back to you on the specific number once I access it. Sure, sir. Thank you so much. That's it. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Mohit Sarana from CLSA. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Adarsh. Um, I had a question um, on your uh, spreads. Uh, as you highlighted, uh, we are at 3.7%, probably highest after we moved to India's accounting. How sustainable uh, is it like um, uh, to keep your margins at 3.7? I understand that our liquidity is now closer to being more normal. So should one expect uh, margins to remain here or it may taper off, you may take some pricing action? At this moment, we are not proposing to take any pricing action, as you put it. Uh, however, having said that, historically, our net interest margin would be, have always been in a range of 3.2 to 3.3. We have seen, seen a sharp pickup in the net interest margin for the quarter ended March 2021, and now for the second consecutive quarter of June 2021. I personally think that the low interest rate environment will continue for a while. Also, you must understand one other thing, that interest rates are low, which has some positive impact in terms of lower cost of borrowing, but it also has a negative impact in terms of the amount that we earn on our network. So we carry more than one lakh crores of network on which we earn the interest and where the cost is zero naturally, and then we earn the interest rate that is prevalent in the market. So rates in the market over the next X period of time go up by let's say 200 basis points theoretically, then we will earn 200 basis points more on the uh, one lakh crores of network that we carry. Got it. And uh, second question was uh, a comment that came in your opening remarks about uh, normalizing credit costs. And you said over a couple of years, right? Uh, when you go through your provisions, it's, it's uh, fairly high provisions that we have uh, for a secured asset. And collections have picked up in July. So should one expect a normalization in credit costs much sooner, like, like it could happen this year itself, or, or what, what, what would prevent, apart from, say, a big wave three, what prevents a normalization in credit cost in the second half this year? So, you know, historically, we have been extremely conservative in our provisioning. You would have seen that there have been several banks and several players in the financial sector who over the last couple of years have seen a quarter or two where they've actually reported accounting losses because they had to catch up with uh, for, with, with provisioning which you know they were they, they they had not made we have been very proactive in our provisioning what we've done is we have we look at every single account wherever we've seen the slightest degree of stress we go ahead and make a provision on that account now at some stage some of that provision will get reversed for example for covid we are carrying a 1017 crores of uh, uh, COVID related provisioning. We do not want at this point of time to release any provisioning. We would like to wait till normalization comes back to the market and then look at reducing the credit costs. But you have seen that over the last uh, uh, quarter or two, the actual credit costs has marginally, it might be a few basis points, has come down. Yeah, no, no, I. I understand. I was I was just asking this in the context of let's say uh, we are almost like you mentioned about uh, collections in July is strong. So I'm just wondering if we are too cautious and guiding to the fact that uh, it may take a year or two years for credit cost to normalize because we are carrying very good provisions on our balance sheet. Well, maybe one would like to be a little conservative in this. We would not like to straight away. Uh, reverse our provisioning or slow down on our provisioning going forward till we have complete clarity on where COVID is ending up and whether we have a third wave and a fourth wave or whatever. 
Perfect. So thank you. As long as that uncertainty remains, we would like to continue being a, a higher provided than what is required by regulation. I'll just repeat some numbers for you. Our total provision we carry is 13,189 crores, and the regulatory provisioning we are required to carry is 5,778 crores. So compared to a regulatory requirement, we are carrying 128% uh, higher provisioning. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shubhranshu Mishra from Systematic Shares. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. The first question is it's slightly baffling to see, uh, you know, slippages in home loans given the fact that mo uh, largely it's a consumption product, whether it's for self-employed or for the salaried. And also, uh, it will it will be the last in the hierarchy of payouts for the customer to really uh, slip because largely he would slip on an unsecured loan, which is a personal loan or a credit card uh, payment. So, uh, if you could qualify this particular question, the, uh, the second question is on uh, we have been speaking about the digital platform so in the budgeting exercises which all uh, life stages of the credit are we budgeting for a uh, OPEX decrease and what is the quantum of that and uh, the third is any thoughts on reverse merger with HDFC Bank all right so let me answer one and three and I will request uh, my colleague Renu to answer the second one uh, the first one you talked about was uh, on uh, Credit, sorry, you talked about credit costs and by customer reports. See, what you must understand is that in the last uh, one year or little more than one year, it is not possible for us to physically meet any customer. So all collection effort is done by on the phone or a customer or uh, the customer would have given us a mandate and the, like, based on that mandate, we would debit his account if, the, if, if for whatever reason that mandate bounces, then we have we, we normally would physically meet the customer, which we cannot do now. Second is, as I mentioned earlier, courts have stopped uh, any lender, any secured lender, from taking action against the property. So you can't go to surface the action. So that creates a little bit of, of I would say, complacency on the part of a customer. I would say these are the two attributes. But having said that, the average loan-to-value ratio at the time we grant the loan is only about 67 or 68 percent. And when the first round of COVID happened, we had done a very quick sort of back of the envelope calculation of what the average loan-to-value ratio for the book as a whole would be. And we were of the view at that time that it would be somewhere in the 40, 42, 43 type of per percent type of range. So the security cover is huge. So these are, to my mind, temporary slip, slippages. These are not in any way, to my mind, going to result in loan losses or uh, anything of that sort because the security cover is huge. And if not today, then whenever we see the end of COVID, we should be able to take legal action and take, uh, take possession of the property. So this is as far as recovery is concerned. Your third question on reverse merger. Uh, we had looked at this very seriously sometime in 2014, and then we did not proceed because of the fact that there were a lot of reserve requirements of me being a bank. And we have not had any discussion with HDFC Bank after 2014 on a reverse merger. Do you know on the digital thing you want to talk about? Yeah, sure. So I think um, as far as the cost, coming down costs are concerned, it will take some time. Right now, what is happening is the sourcing. The sourcing has come through uh, hugely on the digital platform. But having said that, unlike uh, you know, a, a consumer product loan, in a housing loan, you need a lot more documents that need to be uploaded. For example, the title documents regarding the property, etc. So the Indian consumer still needs a lot of help. So the nudge is required from, our, from the telephone operators, the people who are handling them, and thereafter, even uh, you know, from some of our feet on street. So to that extent, it is going to take some time. Having said that, you know, even signing of documents today has to be done in person. Uh, wet signatures, you know, have to be there. Dry signatures are not allowed. So the individual needs to come to the uh, to the office. We need to have people who are going to make them sign those documents. As far as legal checks are concerned, these are documents that have to be seen. As yet, we haven't reached that level. Nirvana, as I, as I would say, that you know, by just looking at a document on a screen, you can be sure that it is, you know, the correct document. 
technical uh, you know appraisals and visits of properties still need to be done people need to see it we are using technology for once the technical appraisal has been done how to go ahead and then you know uh, do the second and the third appraisal so i they will definitely be but i think it has to still reach that level of total digitization which also means some piece of uh, digitization of land records where you can access all those things at a click of a button today that is not happening so what has happened is the the individual coming to us on the digital uh, platform then having people either telephone operators or even street on street helping them go and you know nudging them actually to uh, upload the documents so that piece actually still needs some bit of human inter intervention i think the next uh, you know as, as things become more uh, uh, you know as as uh, property uh, titles etc become more uh, you know on the technology front all the uh, municipalities become more uh, you know on uh, uh, the property documents get onto those sites then i think you'll see a major cost reduction so some of the verification validation from the point of view of making sure that you know everything is okay with the property still continues to be in the non digital mode that's because the regulations are such and that is that is also because uh, partly because the, um, uh, the the authorities the registrars are also not uh, you know so digitalized as yet but on the first piece that you're talking about uh, the sourcing uh, definitely we are seeing a huge traction but having said that you know when it is uh, uh when when you're seeing the uh, uh when, when there's a huge lockdown the numbers shoot up much more when the lockdown starts opening up even the customers start asking for some sort of more personal interaction i think a housing loan is slightly different from a car loan or a personal loan where people also want to talk to somebody and want to uh, you know sort of get uh, uh, some sort of validation that the property is the right property is the, um, the rate that i'm getting the right rate can i get a better rate so interaction still is there some hu human interaction still is there right if i can just squeeze in one last question ma'am how far back do we go in the title history of any property that we are well yes that's again that is again the law of the land so we go up to 12 years to understand uh, what uh, how what transacted between those 12 years and basically it's basically to understand the concept of adverse possession thank you ladies and gentlemen i request the participants in the question queue please summarize your questions briefly for the management to answer more questions in limited time we'll move on to the next question that is on the line of alpesh from motilal oswal please go ahead yeah hi good afternoon and congrats for the good set of numbers just two questions first is uh, uh, are there any network adjustments because i can see network increase of around 400 crores i can understand 150 would be because of the use of moving towards the network so less 250 crores would be on account of what first and secondly the write off number of around 530 crores would that be a termination losses or the principal value of the of the loan and if if it's a termination losses then what's the principal value of the loan thank you already want to answer that under the run on the network increase sorry i'll pay i'll just get back to you i'm opening my uh, my file but maybe kk can carry on with the second question all right your second question was what else uh sir the uh, write off number for the quarter is around 500 crores so uh, yeah. are those the termination losses or the principal value of the Uh, 500 crores will be the principal value, and this 500 crores would pretend to be a restructured loan which did not get qualified, or it would be a separate loan. No, this would be different. This would not be restructured loans. These would okay. have been loans which would have been in stage three or stage two, and would have got uh, either. So most of these would be one-time settlements. So oh, the loan, okay. and these will be all in the largely in the non-individual category. So the loan amount was X, and you settled it at Y, and the balance is written up. Okay, and the COVID provision of around thousand crores is sitting in the ECR, right? Of around thirteen thousand crores. Thousand crores, thousand seventeen crores is sitting in ECR. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, Conrad, if you can just get back on that net worth adjustment, there is a difference of around two fifty crores. Uh, it's basically ESOP adjustments. 
So ESOP would be the amount that you rooted through PNL to reserves that it goes. It would be around 150 and no, 250 no, no, would be the yeah, which have been subscribed. So we can talk offline, but it's, it's basically the ESOP adjustments. Okay, there is no other adjustment. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Bhanti Chawla from IDBI Capital. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, just two uh, data key points, if you can share. First is the uh, absolute disbursement number for the quarter for the individual, as you shared. And secondly, if uh, any ECLGS disbursement we have done during the quarter, if I remember rightly, uh, last year, uh, FI20, it was 936. Uh, uh, 936 crores we have disbursed under ECLC up to FI21. Okay, uh, the disbursements in the first quarter, Conrad, if you can just call out the, the, the absolute rupee amount. But uh, to give you percentage growth, the percentage growth for uh, the quarter was as much as 181% compared to what it was in the previous year. Uh, Bunty, ECLGS disbursements as of, as of June is 1,455. And the so same on uh, disbursement number for the quarter, specific absolute amount. KK has given you the growth number. I would not have the exact number, but the growth number is there. Oh, Do you want okay. the sale disbursements which I gave you? Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll give you the disbursement number in a minute. Please carry on. I'll answer that later. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shweta Daptadar from Prabhudas P. Lagar. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir, for the opportunity. The two questions. One, uh, so because the COVID impact was severe this time around in the hinterland, how has been the asset quality performing for affordable housing segment below 20 ATS, 20 lakh ATS? And secondly, uh, so like you mentioned in your uh, press release, so now that the surface resolutions will pick up uh, for the individual home loan segment, now that even the courts, uh, court order curves are temporarily, which were uh, holding up are all behind, and the collection efforts which were hindered uh, in the month of May, June, so considering these uh, going forward, the EAT should be much lower for the remaining part of the year in the individual housing loan segment. Well, the first question on uh, on delinquencies, be, there is not much difference on whether it is in the affordable housing segment or otherwise. Because for affordable housing, if you look at it, uh, we give loans to customers in the economically weaker section and in the lower income group, but this is not those very small size loans that some of the smaller housing finance companies do. Our average loan to customers in the economically weaker, weaker section is 11.1 .1 lakhs and the average loan to customers in the lower income group is 19.3 lakhs. So again, in terms of asset quality, not too much of it. Second is your question going forward. Surface has still not, we are still not allowed to go through a legal process of recovery even now. So we hope that if there is no uh, major third wave, then sometime during the course of the next few weeks, or next few months, uh, the government or the courts will uh, remove the restriction of not taking legal action. That should certainly help in the recovery effort. But uh, collection efficiency, uh, let me tell you again, July was strong at 98.3%. Sure, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhishek Mararka from HSBC. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking my question. So I have just two questions. Uh, one, from a disbursement uh, uh, point of view, I know you've given uh, percentages on growth versus July last year, but can you share how it compares with disbursements in February or March this year? Uh, the second question is on affordable housing. If you can share, you know, some more detail like incremental yields and also what is the mix, uh, you know, of salaried, self-employed, in general, the customer profile uh, in this segment. Thank you. All right, so I think before I answer your question, go back to the earlier question on that network adjustment that someone had asked. 
there is no network adjustment for anything other than uh, one is for that ESOP exercise bit and the other is on the share premium that is received on allotment of stock options. So when an employee exercises the stock option, he pays, uh, he, he obviously buys the share at a premium and that premium comes as part of network. So that explains the uh, whatever 100, 150 odd crores of increase in the network. Uh, Abhishek, are you done with the yeah. question? No, no. Uh, this was an answer to the previous you question. The, you wanted the profile of new customers. So roughly about 81 odd percent of the new customers who've taken a loan are employed. Roughly about 19 percent are self-employed, which would include self-employed professionals. The average loan amount for new loans we've done in the current year is 33.0.9 lakhs. Now, if we were to compare the month, compare it July, July was the third largest disbursements we had in history. If you were to compare sequentially, March was the highest level of disbursements we've ever had in history. Uh, if we were to compare Jan to March with, uh, uh, with uh, April to uh, July, uh, we would have, uh, April to June, I'm sorry, we would have seen a sequential decline in disbursements during the quarter, but that was largely because of the fact that uh, uh, April was the second half of April and almost the whole of May was impacted because of COVID. No, Kiki, my question was more of July versus, let's say, March. So versus March, July so has July, been similar. July was, July was the third largest disbursements in history. Uh, our disbursements in the month of July totaled to 12,518 crores. And March was an absolutely exceptional month. March, the disbursements were 16,000 crores. Uh, but July would have been higher, for example, than February. You said compare July with February and March. July was higher than February, but lower than March. Oh, and this is all individual disbursements? Oh, I'm individual. I'm talking individual. Sure. And the uh, mix of salaried and self-employed that you shared, uh, would that be similar for affordable housing portfolio or there the ratios would be much different? I would say a bulk of the affordable housing segment would be in the, in, in the employed category and not in the self-employed category. But I don't have a breakdown of how much is employed. You're right, Kiki. The affordable is most in the employed category. Okay, and the incremental yield on the affordable portfolio would be approximately how much? Will not be significantly different from what it is elsewhere because please understand that affordable, I explained that earlier, is not these loans of four, 4 lakhs and 5 lakhs. These are two good quality customers. It's just that the size of the loan is smaller and their income is relatively lower. All the units are smaller. Sure, sure. Thanks so I much, think, I think one thing that we've seen... Uh, in the month of uh, June, July, you know, the last few quarters, high-end homes, uh, by high-end, I don't mean the very high-end, but uh, homes of three, four crores, were not seeing much traction. What we've seen since March and this first quarter, we are seeing those moving. And I think that has been a positive because it is also middle to high-income housing, which uh, in the last few, you know, quarters had slowed down to some extent. And that's been a big positive in the seeing uh, middle-income uh, people going out and looking at apartments. The, the feedback you get from builders is also that a lot of people come on Saturday, Sundays. And so I think other than what you call sort of affordable, which by definition seems smaller loans, but I'm saying the mid-level uh, properties and mid-level homes are also now, you know, being, uh, we are seeing the, the traction there. Okay. Thanks for that color, Amy. Really. Thank you, and all the best for the next quarter. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Ms. Chinchavade from Kodak Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, just before I ask my questions, uh, I was wondering if you shared the disbursement number for, number for the quarter. Yeah, sure. So quarter one disbursements for this year were 25,518 crores of rupees. Mm -hmm. Wondered where the figure right? Have I given the right figure? Take your right. Twenty-five thousand five one eight. Twenty-five thousand five hundred and eighteen crores to be precise. And this quarter one paid. of last year had been nine thousand and seventy-four crores. 
Okay. Uh, just now on the write off of 500 crores, uh, you know, any breakup between individual and non-individuals? I mentioned it's almost entirely in, or non-individuals. Individuals is very, very, very small, extremely small. Sure. I mentioned that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, on the new business, I know you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the breakup between, uh, you know, higher end and uh, the affordable one. But if you could give some color in terms of uh, geographical trend and uh, probably a breakup between new and renewables. Geographical trend as in north, south, east, west, all right. So if you look at uh, northern branches, they account for about 26% of the business done in the first quarter. Southern branches account for about 33%. Western branches account for 37% and Eastern branches account for 4%. That's the geographical breakdown. And new and renewal? I'm sorry? Uh, between new and renewal in the sense of new properties versus renewals. All right, so roughly 56% would be new properties, 36% uh, would be resale, and about 8% would be self-construction. And how would this be like a year back or how would this have changed if it could be some color? I don't think there would have been any significant difference. It would be more or less uh, similar. Yeah, not much, at the... not much of a, not that much of a difference. If you go back three, four years, then you might see a difference. But in the last, uh, uh, you know, a uh, couple of years, it's been very similar. Where, uh, you know, what happens, a lot of uh, people who are upgrading, uh, from or, uh, upgrading from a one bedroom to a two bedroom to a three bedroom, the people who are coming more into the cities. So since we, you know, we had two huge cycles actually. If you look at HDFC, you're seeing a lot of that happening. Uh, old customers are coming back and upgrading to a better property. So it's not, uh, but it hasn't changed that much. Perfect. Thank you very much, and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nitin Jain, private investor. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. So uh, the only question I have is uh, what kind of traction are we seeing on the Indebulls partnership? And are we looking for any more such partnerships? Thank you. We, it's still to uh, actually take off. Uh, we, are still, uh, we are in the process of working out the documentation and, you know, how exactly it's going to pan out. And uh, uh, But having said that, I just want to reiterate, which we've been saying in the past, uh, that as far as the credit assessment is concerned, as far as the eligibilities are concerned, as far as the checks are concerned, uh, it's all going to be with HDFC. Uh, yes, India Bulls is going to source it and are going to keep a certain percentage of the loan. Uh, but uh, the credit call and the sanctioning, the final sanctioning authority is going to be with us. As far as the second question on whether we are looking at tying up, yes, we are in the process. We are talking to actually uh, more than us. We've got feelers from a couple of others who want to tie up with us and want to see whether they can do that. And so uh, let's see. You might uh, see in the next few quarters uh, uh, how this is going to work. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Preeti RS from UTI. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, sir. Uh, so my question is on the RBI guidelines with respect to the minimum assets towards housing finance and individuals. So uh, uh, basically, part of this, first of all, this exercise is done a standalone and not consolidated because uh, since the corporate is large investment. Uh, two, where do we stand today? And uh, three, what it means to our strategy going forward uh, in looking looking towards 24 because that's where we have to adhere to all the uh, I think the, the guidelines that have been set. Uh, so what, what do what would it mean to a strategy on a non-housing portion? So I think Rangan answered that question in the beginning. I think that was one of the first questions that was asked. So we are on track. We had laid down a plan on how we are going to achieve that uh, requirement of 60 and 50 percent by RBI, which as you said is over a over a period of time. And as we speak today, we are very much on track. Uh, as far as the 50% one is concerned, we are already higher than that, so that is not a, uh, anything to sort of look at. As far as the 60% one is concerned, we are currently short by, or we were currently short in March by about uh, two and a half, four percent. If memory serves me right, 
but that was what the original plan was. We are a little ahead of what the original plan was. Also, in the first quarter of this year, the growth has largely, has almost entirely been on individual loans. And since it's been on individual loans, that number would have, uh, uh, we would have got close to taking that 60% gap, gap in June. Do you want to add anything? One more question was on the standalone versus consolidated. This is to be reckoned on the basis of standalone accounts. But having said that, the standalone accounts, you have to reckon the full total assets, which includes the investments in subsidiary companies. Got it, sir. Sir, in terms of the strategy on the non housing, so would it mean a higher construction finance going forward and lower corporate and LRD in the longer run? No, no, not nothing like that. I mean, as once we fall into line, we we would look at good business. If, uh, obviously, individuals is always going to be our biggest focus, and this belief that non-individual business carries a higher yield and therefore is more profitable is not it's not entirely correct, because when you factor in the higher amount of capital required, when you factor in the higher amount of risk that is involved in non-individual business, the actual return on equity is the same whether it is individual or non-individual. But construction finance gives us access to customers who are looking to buy properties. It gives us access to information on individuals even before they've actually gone and executed a sale deed or registered a deed or entered into an agreement with the builder. So that's why construction finance is obviously something which we will continue to sort of focus on. But all, all elements, whether it is individual, non-individual, construction, finance, uh, corporate, LRD, we would look at all of them in the same uh, sort of a manner, like credit quality being of paramount importance. Thank you, sir. Thanks for this. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the last question. I now hand the conference over to the management for the closing comments. On behalf of HDSC, thank you to everyone uh, for attending this call. In case you still have any questions, you can contact Anjali or me after this call. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of HDFC Limited, that concludes this conference call. We thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.